Take it away, Ben. All right. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, and, of course, welcome to the final talk in the Ontario County Historical Society Virtual Winter Speaker Series. Um, as always, my name is Ben Falter, I'm the Director of Education at this Ontario County Historical Society, and we are so excited to be closing out our first annual uh, virtual speaker series. Um, before I turn things over to our wonderful presenter, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, you know, this speaker series has been highlighting cloth and textiles to coincide with our current exhibit, Fibers of Our Lives. If you have not already visited the exhibit, it will be closing in late April. So make your way on down to OCHS to come check it out before it closes. Uh, I would especially recommend it if you enjoy this talk and you are in the Canandaigua area because I think you will really enjoy the exhibit. Uh, you can find out more information about the Historical Society right on our website, and there should be a link to that in the description of this talk. Um, and of course, with this being the last talk, I would like to thank everyone who has registered to attend any or all of these talks. Uh, we have really appreciated all of the support and success that we've had this year with this speaker series, um, and we're really looking forward to making this an annual event moving forward. Also, if you're looking for something fun to do this weekend, there's still time to purchase tickets for our Vinyl Record Night event at the Historical Society. It'll be taking place this Saturday from 6 to 8 p.m. Tickets are $20. Uh, the Canandaigua Record Exchange will be providing music. You'll have a chance to see some artifacts that are not usually out in public areas. And included in your ticket uh, purchase are two drink tokens that you can use for beer or soft drinks, um, as well as entry into a raffle for prizes from the Canandaigua Record Exchange. Uh, advanced purchase of tickets is necessary to attend, so if this sounds at all fun to you, head on over to our website uh, down in the description to pick your tickets up. I'd also like to, as always, thank our exhibit sponsors, Canandaigua National Bank, Cats in the Kitchen, and Lazy Acre Alpacas for their continued support of the Historical Society and what we do. Um, and, you know, final bit of housekeeping, of course, if you have any questions or comments at any time during the talk, please feel free to type them into the live chat, and I will pass them on to our speaker during the Q&A period at the end of the talk. Uh, and you may access video playback of the talk after it concludes from the same link that you are using to tune in right now. But without further ado, allow me to introduce Hallie Bond. Uh, Hallie is the town historian for Long Lake, New York. Uh, this is a, a beautiful township in the Adirondacks that includes both Long Lake and Racket Lake. If you haven't been up to that area before, I'd highly recommend it. It's a beautiful place to go. Weird stuff with OBS. Okay, we're good. We're back up. Yes, as, as Ben mentioned, I'm currently the town historian in Long Lake, um, but this is kind of a retirement gig. And um, for 30, the main part of my uh, career was spent at the Adirondack Museum, where I was the a curator um, in charge of the boat collection primarily, but I also was able to continue my uh, interest in uh, material culture and women's lives. Uh, and that's what um, I, I want to make sure everybody knows where I'm coming from. I'm a historian and I'm a material culture person. So what I really like to do is look at objects and see what they can tell us about uh, the people who made them and the people who used them. So I hang on just a moment and we will you don't have to look at me anymore you can look at Rhoda Clark um, sitting there on her rustic bench near Willsboro in about 1885 working on her sewing um, cast your mind back to uh, high school uh, or maybe college when you were often if you were if you're asked to do an essay question you were often told compare and contrast whatever it was uh, this evening i'm going to do that with you we're going to compare and contrast the stories um told in the fibers of our lives exhibit that you have down there in canandaigua as, it as they took part place in a different part of New York State, uh, what we up here call the North Country. Um, what is the North Country? 
the North Country is basically New York State north of the Mohawk. It's kind of an island with water all around it. Uh, and most of the space is taken up by the Adirondack Mountains. Uh, the area covers 18,000 square miles of land, uh, but it's pretty sparsely populated, especially around there in the middle, um, in the mountainous area. Um, it's uh, the larger settlements are con um, concentrated on the lowlands between the mountains and the water all around. Um, actually, here we go. I guess I can use my pointer on this. So, yes, here here's the Adirondack Mountains in the middle, and where most of the people are, the better farming land. And here you are. Um, I hope I've got that right. Uh, the uh, Canandaigua on Canandaigua Lake. Um, the uh, area was pretty much um, devoted to farming and resource extraction, which is to say mostly logging, some mining as well, and tourism. Um, from the beginnings of white settlement in the 1820s and 30s, um, right up to right now, in fact, right now, tourism is really um, the main uh, driver of the economy and all this. And I started this uh, study um, um, to just to fill in the context of um, the, of quilts and quilt making. I've been, um, and the quilts and quilt making part of it is a, is a project that I've been working on now for a little over 10 years. Um, I've been documenting quilts all over the North Country um, for uh, since that time with uh, as, as part of the Northern New York Quilt Project, which is under the aegis of traditional arts in upstate New York, which is a um, folklore organization in Canton, Canton being right up here in the northern part, the St. Lawrence Valley. Um, we have found quilts dating from about 1800 right up to the present, and we now have a database of over 600 quilts completing, uh, completed with um, measurements, descriptions, and as much background information as we could get. And to fill in the picture, I have um, also explored retail accounts, photographs, memoirs, and diaries like that of a woman named Mabel Sprague Laidlaw. Mabel was uh, born in Northern New York in 1876. In 1902, she married a doctor and they set up his practice in the village of Canton, which is a pretty good sized place. This is a picture of it about the time Mabel lived there around the turn of the century. Um, it had a population of about 6,000 people. And the historians are ever grateful that she kept it, started writing in a diary the year before she got married and kept writing every single day until her death in 1953. Uh, every couple of days is a reference to sewing, particularly in the earlier years of her marriage when her children were small. Um, usually she notes what she's working on, but this entry here, I sewed nearly all day and have my supply of stock sewing finished. I'm so glad. Um, suggests the everyday never-ending pile of mending, hemming, darning, and plain sewing, um, hemming, uh, making things like sheets and pillowcases. Most scholarly attention to home sewing, and there is scholarly attention given to home sewing, by the way, has been given to garment making. Um, and much of Mabel's work is on clothing for her children, for herself, and shirts and night work, um, night shirts for her husband. Uh, ready to wear clothing for men uh, happened quite a lot earlier um, around the uh, Civil War uh, and was much more available than ready to wear for women. Um, the scholars see garment production as part of the cult of domesticity that codified woman's place in the home as a bulwark against the competitive business-oriented world outside the home. Making clothing was a way for women to show their love and care for their family as well as a way to establish and maintain status. As Mabel's diaries show, however, making clothing was only part of her sewing work. What about the sheets, aprons, diapers, curtains, rugs, dish towels, and of course, quilts and comforters that had to be made, mended, and maintained? It is on these household textiles that I'm going to focus today as a way of placing quilts and quilt making within the larger world of needlework for the home. Production and maintenance of household textiles was part of women's work just as much as childcare and meal preparation. Mabel was fairly well off and lived in a village, uh, but her near contemporary, Lucelia Mills Clark, is another example who also had kept a diary for many, many years and wrote in it daily. 
Um, this is Lucilia on the left here with her husband and one of their dogs. Um, and the little uh, log house they lived in near Cranberry Lake. Um, in 1888, she and her husband Henry had homesteaded in this log house deep in the woods uh, where they farmed and eventually raised eight children, six of whom were daughters, happily for Lucilia's housekeeping. They were about three and a half miles from the hamlet of Cranberry Lake, which had only a few hundred inhabitants when they moved to the area. In 1902, a large hardwood lumber concern moved in and established a mill at Cranberry Lake, complete with store, boarding house, and railroad, and the population increased to over a thousand. Imagine that. Um, both Mabel in town and Lucille in the woods made lots of dish towels. Um, in 1909, Lucilia ripped up sugar sacks to make five dish towels. The next year, she made nine sugar sack towels in one stint. On February 18th, in 1915, after a sewing session of several days, Mabel, Mabel noted that my 31 towels were washed and hung out today. Both women also made plenty of sheets and pillowcases. Mabel purchased factory woven tubing for the pillowcases available because so many women made their own pillow slips. The textiles that went on top of the sheets lasted much longer and so aren't mentioned as often in women's diaries. North Country women often make a clear distinction between quilts and comforters, by the way, or tied quilts. And this is a classic example of a North, North Country uh, comforter. Um, tied quilts generally get short shrift in the quilt literature and in collections. I think probably because of the extra aesthetic dimension that um, of, of the decorative quilting. That's the running stitches that, that often go around applique pieces or um, in decorative patterns. Um, and also, I think, because of an innate bias towards masterworks, things that obvi obviously took a lot of skill and time to make. But over a quarter of the quilts in the New York, uh, Northern New York Quilt Project were tied, a high proportion as compared with other collections. Comforters were a very important part of the culture of home sewing in Northern New York. Edna West Heal, who painted this little picture, was a newspaper woman who late in life wrote a charming little book of reminiscences, which I highly recommend. It was called Adirondack Tales, A Girl Grows Up in the Adirondacks in the 1880s. Teal is also known as the Grandma Moses of the Adirondacks because of the scenes of her childhood um, in, in northeastern, the Northeastern Mountains that she um, painted over her life and which accompanied the book. Um, this one she called Grandmother's Quilt. And she wrote in her book, Patchwork quilts were scarcely more than the frosting on a cake. They were largely the decorative topping, the counterpanes. They had to be thin in order to be quilted, but they kept out very little of the wintry cold. The comfort and warmth of beds in unheated houses depended on what was under the counterpane. For top cover warmth, housewares made up comfortables. And that's a, that's a great word that I think maybe we should bring back into use. These two might be of patchwork, but the pieces were apt to be large. Odds and ends of any colors were used, and the work wasn't fine and patterned like the quilted ones. And this, um, as we'll see later, I don't think entirely holds true. But she went on to say they were filled with thick layers of cotton batting and tied with gay yarn every four to six inches to hold the cotton in place. Just like this one. This one came from Rhoda Clark's family over there in Willsboro and Lake Champlain. Comforters can indeed accommodate thicker fillings in quilts, especially important in this northern climate with uninsulated houses. Most of the comforters we found did indeed have cotton as filling, but we also found a few wool ones and a number filled with blankets, quilts, or other comforters. Eight of the 116 comforters in the survey had a lightweight wool or a cotton blanket or a heavy cotton flannel sheet as filling. Many quilts and blankets used as filling, no doubt, were badly worn, and the comforter continued to their usefulness. But some women, like Matilda Morris and Bice, purchased new blankets to fill comforters in the first decades of the 20th century. This is Tilly, as she was known on the left there in her Sunday go to meet and clothes. And one of the one of her quilts, um, Matilda Jane Morris and Bice was born on a farm in charmingly a little named place called Pumpkin Hollow in 1881. In 1903, she married a farmer named Peter Bice, and they settled down in Gilmantown, a community of 14 families not far from her parents. 
like most Adirondack farms, neither of um, these farms produced enough of anything to sell. They just fed the farm families. And those families had to earn cash um, in part-time, usually seasonal. It's actually a pineapple pattern, um, for those of you who are quilters, made with prints. Um, and it's, it's crazy. I love it. Comforters also appealed to North Country women because of the speed with which they could be tied. On October 20th, 1909, Lucilia and her friend Mrs. Clock put on a quilt with, um, on, onto their frame and with daughter May tied it off before supper. This was probably just one afternoon's work for these three women. Lucilia also recorded tying off a quilt in one day by herself and another in one day with the help of Mrs. Clock. Maintenance of clothing and, and household textiles uh, is a major part of the culture of home sewing, not only mending and darning, but making over and cleaning. A radical makeover on clothing was to rip out all of the seams, wash the fabric, and then press it before using it as yard goods and perhaps quilt, quilt scraps. Turning was less drastic, that is, switching worn parts with less worn parts. Blankets and sheets were easy to turn. My grandmother still did this the days before fitted sheets. You just, um, before they get holes in them, but when they're getting worn in the middle, you cut them down the middle and um, flip them so that the outside edges are in the center. Um, Lucilia Clark also turned pants. Um, her husband would wear out the knees, so before they got a hole in them, she'd cut the legs mid-thigh and turn them around so that the worn knee was at the back of the leg and exposed to less wear. And you can see from this quote on the bottom that Lucilia Clark got a lot done, um, kept that farm going, and also did um, plenty plenty of sewing work. Um, quilts and comforters also got cut down when parts became worn or torn. Here are two of the 11 examples I found um, in the Northern New York Quilt Project. The quilt on the left um, here, you can see, has just been cut where the, uh, probably the edges were worn. And the one um, on the right almost looks as if it was just kept as a, uh, a memento because it's really a pretty um, small piece there. Women mended and darned quilts just as they did their other clothes and textiles. Um, this is an interesting example of a comforter from uh, Elizabethtown, which is also over near Lake Champlain. And it was made with woolen scraps um, from, uh, from home-woven home blankets. And you can see here, um, the left is the front and the, the right is the back, a very careful darning job on the front there on the left. And over on the right, I uh, got quite a variety of mins, um, some that wonderful reverse applique patch down here um, and a couple little less, less fancy patches, but got, got to keep that thing going. And then there's preventive maintenance. One of the uh, interesting things I found on a number of quilts what, what was what um, many people called a whisker guard. Um, I heard someone call it a snot guard, which is in this case, a um, piece of muslin that gets snapped on over, there are little snaps on the quilt and snaps on the whisker guard, over the top edge of the quilt um, so it won't get worn um, or, or snotty. Um, that would that would be kind of like a stitch of nine saving time. We talked about quilts and comforters being used as filling. Um, another way of looking at it is that the comforter got recovered. Um, it, this is a, an example from the Clark family over on Lake Champlain. This is the whole quilt on the left. And on the right, you can see that there's a, a hole and never to get mended. And on the inside is another another comforter. Mabel Sprague Laidlaw made entirely new covers or slips, as she called them, when the old ones were worn or badly soiled. I got to wondering if her comforters um, and many of the other ones we saw had been commercially made um, because th that was a possibility. And I didn't find that Mabel Laidlaw made very many quilts at all. Um, she doesn't record that in her diary. I did find a 1917 manual uh, for school sewing teachers that claimed that machine-made comforters had been available since 1875 and were quite popular. They quoted statistics showing that nearly 4 million are sold yearly. 
And if you look in the 1908 Sears and Roebuck catalog, um, you can find a selection ranging from fancy print reversible bed comforters for 75 cents to our new Persian design figured sateen comforter for $3.35. I also found uh, the accounts in the accounts of the O'Hara store in Inlet in 1893, um, a, a notation for buying a bale of comforters for $12. A bale of cotton at the time was 500 pounds. So this was, seems like it was a lot of comforters. Some prescriptive literature promoted comforters as more healthful because they could be more easily washed than quilts. Um, presumably this meant removing the cover and washing it and then putting the thing back together again. But the lumpy condition of many comforters we found suggests that most owners did not, in the event, take them apart for cleaning. They just tossed them in the wash tub. The Lewis County owners of this one um, should have taken it apart uh, because what they perhaps didn't know was the filling was wool and they'd washed the whole thing in hot water. So you can see the wool has shrunk up and leaving the, um, the patchwork top all puckered. David Pinkham, the great grandson of Matilda Bice, um, whose quilt we saw earlier, remembered here helping his grandparents on comfort a wash day in the mid 20th century. It was an outdoors job and he and his grandfather um, had the muscular part of wringing the heavy textile between them af after it came out of the wash tub. They then draped it over several parallel lines of the clothesline to dry for as long as it took, which was generally um, several days. And, and they had to take the thing inside at night so it wouldn't get dampened with dew. As the author Sarah Gordon reminds us in her book about home sewing, gender and culture, the thrift of home sewing enabled a woman to be an economic agent within the family, even if she didn't bring in cash, since making was almost cheap, always cheaper than buying. Gordon is talking about garments. But this applies as well to the production of all household textiles. Thrift also has a moral and even a religious dimension, particularly in the Mennonites of Lewis County, who have existed as a community there since they came seeking freedom for persecution in Switzerland in the 1830s. Um, this picture is of, of a comforter blitz, as they called it, um, that took place in 2017 in the Krogan uh, Mennonite Church. They have an enormous church hall. They had about eight quilt frames set up. Uh, people, the women had made the uh, tops in the, their sewing circles prior to this, and then they put them all out on the frames with the batting and backing during this comforter blitz. And they ended up um, making over a hundred quilts uh, in a three-day weekend, which went for Mennonite to the Mennonite Central Committee, and also to support their local school. And these women told me that uh, they still save and use scraps, even the smallest ones, which they call schnibbles. Um, they originally, you know, spoke German. Uh, the schnibbles go into the children's toys as stuffing. And they say these bits not out of poverty. Most of them are dairy farmers making good livings off the milk and maple syrup they produce. But it is a religious tenet with them to make good use of the resources that God has provided. And I think that this really holds true for um, so many women and people generally probably um, before the present day of, of our grand consumer culture. Uh, that it just it just is a shame to to get rid of something that still has some good in it. Uh, and it's, so it's not necessarily only a poor woman who uses scraps, but very often poor women do use scraps. For women in the cash poor farms and mountains of the Adirondacks, pieces of fabric, no matter how small, became part of the general stock of what a woman had to work with in keeping her house, just like a barrel of flour. David Pinkham, the present owner of 33 quilts and comforters made by um, his great grandmother, Matilda Morrison Bice, and her mother and daughter, remembered, as he said, all the women I knew saved every piece of cloth they could. Many swapped it for something else they liked better, for something that another could use. Cloth was a commodity of value. They would leave their collections to legatees. The ladies would move house, and along would grow the, go the cloth rolls or bag scraps. And this, these are some examples that he still has and is in the family house. Um, on the top there is a roll of shirt scraps. Uh, and they, this is only part of several barrels of fabric scraps that still await assembly. 
some of the, these scraps are from garments and some are commodity bags, which I'll talk about in a minute, like that Jack Frost sugar bag. And some of these shirt scraps, um, they came from the, the shirt factory in Corinth. Um, one of the other, a couple of the other women um, in the family worked there seasonally. And what was happening was that if a shirt went, didn't pass inspection because it, or part shirt part didn't pass inspection because it had a flaw in it or was sewn together wrong, um, these were rolled up and sold for cheap or maybe even given away, I'm not sure, um, to people who were, to women who worked there. And here are a couple of quilts from uh, the, the uh, Pinkham collection. And you can see um, in this quilt here, we've got a, a, the end of a shirt plaque. So she just cut out the, the piece and didn't waste a bit of it. Up here is the, the, the number, um, I think it's a style probably in the size, 1536, that you would often see stamped on the shirt tail. And this here uh, is one side of a double-sided quilt made with, made with these shirt, shirt scraps. And I found um, these uh, shirting quilts and comforters all over the um, southern part of the Adirondacks because where the, the rivers fall off the plateau there, there were good water power sites initially, then um, the, and then the factories were probably powered by steam and then electricity. But um, there, were quite a, there was quite a cluster of them around the southern Adirondacks. Um, the shirting was new fabric purchased for the purpose, but cheaply or free with employment for the shirt factories in the area. Another free or uh, type of fabric that wasn't wasted was um, technically commodity bags, but we can also, uh, you often hear them called feed sacks because much of them did come with feed, but they also contained sugar, flour, um, cornmeal um, and egg mash to feed your laying hens, as we see over there. These are both, um, these pictures are both taken from the backs of some of those uh, pincom, pincom quilts. Um, you, these uh, factory, the, these fabric sacks that were the, the standard in um, commodity sales before uh, paper came along, or paper was widely used, uh, became so popular as sources of fabric for for women making various things, clothing. I've I've heard of one of the um, Mennonite ladies told me about her going away dress when she got married was was made from feed sacks. Um, that the, the 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 sack companies and bag companies were in such competition that they started making prints, and this is a uh, a baby quilt from that Mennonite community over in Lewis County that was made entirely from feed sacks. Now you wouldn't really know um, because fabric is fabric and the prints are just reflect whatever was popular at the time. Um, but I was told by the family that that's what um, these are. And if you were going to make something bigger like uh, that had to match like clothing, you had to send your husband off um, with strict directions to, to the feed store to get um, two sacks or three sacks or however many you needed of the same print. I was also told by the, the donors of this quilt to the Adirondack Museum that the inside is also um, another type of free fabric and that is milk strainers. And you um, you folks down in, in Ontario County are no doubt have plenty of quilts around the area made from feed sacks and probably also milk strainers as well. Um, and for those of you who don't, didn't grow up on a farm in the 1950s or 40s, um, there was a state law that specified that before, when you're pouring the milk into the big milk cans, there was a special funnel you had to have, and you had to line it with a square of flannel, um, which could only be used once. But the thrifty Mennonites, and also this lady here who made this quilt up in Russell in the northern part of the Adirondacks, um, washed them out and used them for all sorts of things, I'm sure. Dust rags, diapers, burp cloths, and quilts insides and out like this one here. Um, lots of other uh, unused fabric found in quilts was no doubt left over from garment making. We found plenty of patches with seams in them and it was pretty much a guess whether the seam was in the piece of fabric from which the patch was cut or whether two pieces of fabric were stitched together to make up the size of the patch by a very thrifty quilter. This is a quilt that was made in Baker's Mills um, in the Adirondacks in the 1870s or 1880s. And you can see over here on the right in this close-up, 
um, that even the white, the, the, the white fabrics have been pieced. This is quilting, but this is a seam right here, and there's another seam over here. And when I was able to look at this very closely, I could see that the, um, the, the whites weren't all the same fabric. They were some PK and different weaves and different ways of fabric. Um, but this quilt is also an interesting example of what I found a lot of, which was a combination of this thrifty using of scraps and purchasing fabric to make the scheme up. You'll notice here on the left in the, the overall picture that the color scheme is a little odd. If you might, if you think about it, why would you make a quilt with beige and white? Um, when I thought about that, I got to thinking further about possibly that it, it hadn't always been beige. And sure enough, when I looked at some of the beige parts, if you see over here on the right, um, there's dark thread. And after much research and studying quilt styles of the times and things like that, I determined that probably the, the beige was green originally. Now, um, green fabric is hard to dye. And for a long time, what you did was you dyed fabric blue and then you dyed it yellow or maybe the other way around. Um, and then the two, would, of course, would make green. But along about the time this quilt was made, um, chemists were trying to figure out a single step green, which would be a lot cheaper to make. Um, but it wasn't, but the early ones were very unstable and they often faded to beige like this one here. So I, in, in thinking about what it might've looked like originally, I, I made a reproduction and this is, I think what probably this quilt looked like um, originally. I think that the beige was all green and uh, it would have been quite a lot more striking than it, it is in its faded state. But I always felt sorry for this woman because here she scrimped and sa saved and bought some fabric to, for the highlight of this quilt. And that's the stuff that left her down. The good old scrap reds are bright today as they probably were when she put them in there. Quilting bees are famous in story and song, um, but less common in thinly settled rural areas like the North Country than you probably found them in the village of Canandaigua. Uh, mostly when women got together to sew um, or peel apples, as Rhoda is doing here, they did it with family or, or close neighbors. Of course, there, there weren't very many close neighbors too much. So th this is actually Rhoda Clark and, her, and two of her daughters um, in the early years of the 20th century, sitting outside where it was nice and doing some of their work. Um, Rhoda Clark, like uh, Mabel, lived in a community, um, although she wasn't that close to the village of Willsboro, but um, her community, she was older and the community was smaller than Mabel's up in Canton. We have both quilts and diaries documenting Rhoda's life on the shores of Lake Champlain, um, and she was pretty prosperous. Her husband's family owned and ran a stone quarry and a shipyard um, in addition to several farms about four miles from the village of Willsboro. The community ship, the shipyard quarry was a little community in itself, populated by workers in the households of Rhoda's parents-in-law and also two Clark brothers-in-law, one of whom was married to her sister. So it was a very interconnected little community there. And in the home, uh, the, the main house where Rhoda lived her married life are still 29 quilts made by three generations of Clark women. Um, Rhoda hosted and attended quiltings, um, both associated with her church and also private affairs. And these women started young. On October 11th, 1857, Rhoda, Rhoda wrote in her diary, waited on a quilting party for Olive, nine little girls here her age. Now, Olive was Rhoda's eldest child and was five years old at the time. So her birthday party activity was a quilting bee. In 1879, Rhoda's daughters, Ida, who was 24 by then, and Luella, who was 20, went to something that, that Rhoda termed a young people's quilting, suggesting that this purpose was primarily social and only secondarily to complete a job. But these things only happened a couple times a year. Another uh, North Country woman who left diaries, although no quilts that I've been able to find, was Julia Baker Kellogg. Um, and they cover the same period of Rhoda, as Rhoda Clark's, which makes an interesting contrast because she lived in this log cabin way up in the mountains near Minerva um, on what is now the North Woods Club. And in fact, the, tour, the 
tourists, of whom one was Winslow Homer, came and stayed here when it was still basically just a farm building. Um, and then later those gentlemen uh, bought the place and turned it into a, a club. But she lived a very isolated life in the 1850s and 60s when she was keeping her diary. Um, she was 10 miles away from the nearest village uh, um, and she had no children. So she and her husband, but she and her husband both worked non-farm jobs to um, survive. Even though she was so isolated, she does mention a few quiltings in her diaries um, between the 1866 through the 1870s, uh, one of which she hosted the year her sister was married. And not all North Country quiltings involved quilting. Women got together to tie quilts as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, Lucelia Clark often did this with, with Mrs. Clock, who, whoever she was. Um, quilting bees, even with only a couple of participants, was a continuation of a, an old tr American tradition, probably all European tradition, of changing works. That is cooperative work, um, which combines the tedious routine work with socializing to help it go faster. North Country women got together not only to work the same projects, but simply for company while sewing on their own things. In her author, essay in Barbara Berman's The Culture of Sewing, um, we read that sewing was often a semi-leisure, semi-socializing pursuit, not just a production process. It was a way of getting some pleasure out of what uh, Mabel Sp Sprague Law called stock sewing. And here is Ida Belden Parker, um, the second woman from the left uh, in probably the 1930s uh, in her home in Newcomb, New York which was not far here from Long Lake. Um, and she, the, each of these women is um, doing her own thing, but they're having a, a, a good gossip probably while they're doing it. Um, and in bigger communities, this sort of getting together to sew became formalized to greater or lesser degrees. Mabel Laidlaw records frequently intending what she calls thimble parties from 1909 through 1922. Most of these were held in private homes, uh, but some were held at the Universalist, um, she was a, a member of the Universalist congregation in Canton, or right in the church itself. Um, there seems to have been some organization in these thimble parties, but you don't read about more, uh, minutes being taken and things like that. She also went to uh, an apron committee meeting in November, 1922. And in 1918, during the war, like so many women, she, she stowed for the war effort. Uh, in Canton, there were Red Cross rooms in the village um, for people, women to go there to sew. Mabel's thimble parties were an organized and recognized form of this common um, activity of taking your work along a uh, visit or picking it up when somebody visited you. Uh, the family that, that uh, of which which owns this photograph here of their grannies and great aunts, um, terms this, it calls this photograph, No Idle Hands, which kind of sums up one attitude about this, namely um, idle hands, uh, where the devil finds work for idle hands to do. Uh, so these are the Harrington women in near the little crossroads of Weavertown with Grace Harrington, uh, the little girl there, um, along with her mother and grandmothers and great aunts. Um, we also, uh, Mabel's diary records this uh, a lot, as I mentioned. In 1912, in um, July 15, she wrote, after dinner, I sat on Mrs. Olin's porch and shortened a petticoat. So she just went next door um, and worked, took something that you, she could easily carry along and didn't take too much thought. In 1912, the beginning of August, she wrote, in the afternoon, I hemmed a na napkin on Mrs. Olin's porch. Mrs. Olin's porch must have been a very pleasant place to sit. All of my diarists sewed for cash at some time in their lives, and I found that even the hire of a professional dressmaker often implied um, cooperative work. In the 1870s, Julia Baker Kellogg and her sister Jenny went to Minerva to have their dresses cut. And then, but then they were only cut out in Minerva by the seamstress. She, they took them home and finished them themselves. Mabel Laidlaw, um, being perhaps a little bit more prosperous and also perhaps a little more fashion conscious, um, had a regular woman come to her house twice a year um, in the first two decades of the 20th century 
to sew. And I think the woman lived in the town. She didn't seem to stay with them, but she would come every day um, and work all day, sometimes for four days at a stretch, sometimes to a week and a half. Um, and, and Mabel usually worked right alongside her. The professional seamstress usually, but not always, did the more complicated tasks like the cutting out and um, tucks and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, Mabel was stuck with the plain, with the, the long seams and things like that. Um, the seamstress usually worked on Mabel's dresses. Uh, Mabel herself usually made the children's clothes and less complicated garments for herself, such as chemisettes, kimonos, petticoats, and waists, as well as all the clothing for her two children. In the same years, Lucilia Mills Clark also did household sewing and company, usually with one or several of her six daughters. She didn't have to hire help much, but in 1900, she did hire a Mrs. Potter. Uh, but unlike Mabel's seamstress, um, Lucilia cut out the work and Mrs. Potter did the sewing. There were quilt making professionals in some um, parts of the country, but not too surprisingly, I didn't find much direct evidence of this happening in the North Country. We certainly didn't have the very complicated traditions like Baltimore album quilts in which skilled seamstresses pieced and basted um, and then the purchaser did the assembly and the quilting. But complicated as a state of mind, in Southern Hamilton County in the early decades of the 20th century, a couple of women, um, maiden lady sisters, pieced Dresden plate blocks um, and sold them to passers-by from a roadside stand, perhaps right alongside their corn and tomatoes. And these are two quilts um, that were made with these purchased blocks. We did find some pretty high style fancy quilts, including five um, white work quilts. That is a quilt that has no piecing. It's just a sheet of um, a plain piece of white that has that reply, relies for its decoration on its quilting. And some of them were stuffed like this one here. Um, a little hole is opened in the back and, and co extra cotton is stuffed in to make the relief really high. Um, all of these came from settled areas, not surprisingly. This one here has a very interesting story. Um, I showed it at a, a symposium held by at the DAR Museum in Washington, DC a couple years ago and found a couple of people in the audience who were studying four, had locate four quilts that were almost identical um, in various parts of Connecticut. And it turns out that they were all from the vicinity of Lyme, Connecticut. Now, this one here that was in the Jefferson County Historical Society in Watertown um, had absolutely no information on it. But when I found out about the other ones from Lyme, Connecticut, I realized that there's a Lyme, a town of Lyme in Jefferson County, not far from Watertown. And sure enough, it was settled by people from Connecticut about the time that these quilts were made. So it was interesting. I, I don't, I think probably the quilts were brought to Lyme New York with the settlers and had been made as, as, a, um, as a set, well, maybe not a set, but made by the same makers um, in Lyme, Connecticut. And it's, it's very likely that this was um, drafted by a professional quilt draftsman. That is that the, um, the design was all drawn out by somebody who did this for a living and possibly even quilted in, in a workshop in Lyme because it's quite surprising that all of these quilts are, are very, very similar. Be ready to take your um, buttonholes uh, next door to your to Mrs. Olin's porch. You need to have done the prep work. This followed easily from a separation of tasks within sewing, things that needed to be done with some some infrastructure like a table to cut on or a sewing machine, and then the handwork was the work that you took away with you and could um, or could pick it up anywhere when you got a chance to sit down. Um, these are a couple of uh, quotes from Mabel's diaries uh, relating this kind of work. Um, and it's, it, it's, it, it's, they were written on two different days. And as you can see, she um, got ready to take this handwork of binding buttonholes, she says, for work at Potsdam tomorrow, because um, she and her uh, a group of friends went to visit another friend in Potsdam from Canton. That's about 11 miles, by the way, but they took the train. Um, and they all sat around and worked on their handwork and had a great day, as she, as she relates. 
Um, the separation of tasks, you can see from the objects themselves in the case of quilts. Uh, so I found many, many quilts that had, were the, the, the piece, the blocks that had lots of piecing in them, like you see here on the right, lots of little pieces were, were done sitting down um, when you had little leisure by hand. But these long seams, putting the whole thing together, as you see in the complete quilt on the left, were often, very often done by machine. Um, now, sewing machines were available, generally speaking, around the time of the Civil War. And I found women in the Adirondacks got their machines as soon as they could. Um, Julia Baker Kellogg got one in the late 1850s, um, even in the wilds of Minerva. And we know from um, the sewing machine that the one, Ida Belden Parker, who made that last quilt, gave to the Adirondack Museum with uh, that she had bought it on time and actually paid it off early. This this was the um, the receipt for her machine from the manufacturer from the sales uh, firm in Glens Falls that she kept along with all of her her uh, payments payment receipts right in the drawer of the sewing machine and. They were still there when the museum got them. For many women, the different phases of quilt work happened at different times, perhaps even seasonally. Hand piecing of blocks could happen anytime and was just the sort of pickup work that was handy to have um, ready in a basket. You often find unfilled quilt, quilt tops and stacks of blocks that never got sewn together um, in attics and in, uh, and then in thrift sales and places like that. And I think that, it, that those are a result of this um, stacking, making all the um, blocks by hand at one point and then later on putting them together. This I think here is, is another um, quilt that I think tells me about how it was built. Um, we don't know much about it, except that it was um, made by a woman named Hulda Harrington. You can see her HH up at the top and the date, pretty rare for an Adirondack quilt to be dated like this. Um, and it's got all these different kinds, uh, different sizes and different patterns of blocks. There are these little ones and then the medium sized ones. And then there's this one lone fancy block. And then there are these other ones around the edge. Oops. Um, and I think what this is, uh, Helda Harrington was was in her late 50s by the time she made this. And I think what what she was doing is going through her, her cedar chest or her rag bag and finding all these blocks that she she made a few extra for some quilt or other and had used. And rather than waste them, she put them all together in a quilt, even though putting uh, the sashing on a, a, a quilt with different size blocks like that is a little complicated. Um, and there's some evidence that uh, quilt work was seasonal for Adirondack farm women or North Country farm women generally, especially those on the small farms of the Adirondacks where outside help was scarce. With more daylight hours and more work to do outside, women had less time for sitting down and sewing. When they did work on quilts in the summer, um, I've, I've heard of many that were actually quilting, not piecing. For one thing, small Adirondack houses couldn't accommodate a quilt frame and you could move outside. Um, the Harrington family set up their quilt frame on the thrashing floor of the, of the barn. Uh, Lucelia Clark, who by the 1920s, when these pictures were taken, had um, uh, built little cabins. That's their house there on the left. And on the right one are these the little rustic camps, little cabins that they rented out to hunters and tourists. Um, if there wasn't anybody in there, she could take her quilt uh, frame in there and tie off a, a, quil a quilt or a comforter in that space. But of course, they weren't heated, so she had to do this in the summer weather. An important part of making textiles by hand is, by hand is the rituals known, used, and understood by the participants. In the culture of home sewing, hand-sewn gifts were understood to have a special meaning. Women made all sorts of needlework as presents, items like embro the embroidered corset cover Mabel received from her mother for one birthday, or the handmade guest towel from her friend Mrs. Olin, she of the inviting porch, on her 35th birthday in 1911. Collections in cedar chests today are full of quilts, quilts and other items like this that are given as gifts or made as commemorations. Because of their special meaning, they tend to get saved. This tradition, of course, continues, but by many fewer gift givers. 
this is, a, I think, a charming example of this type of uh, gift, although I, I don't know really anything about it because there was no information on it at the Clinton County Historical Society. Um, but they're both made, I, I'm sure, by the same woman, possibly for daughters or for um, granddaughters. You see the right-hand one, it says Beulah in the middle, and the left-hand one is for Grace, and they both have dates, 1895. Um, these, by the way, are made, uh, they're, they're embroidered in red work, um, red thread. And these little um, blocks, could, they, could they, these designs could be purchased and you could make backsplashes for your washstand or tea towels or whatever, um, or put them into to a quilt like um, whoever Grace and Beulah's grandmother was. But um, while the meaning of the gift to the giver is often preserved, we have to guess at the meaning of the maker making to the maker. Makable's birthday gifts were embroidered. They were fancy work um, rather than plain sewing, sewing that was out of the ordinary, and that's why they made them good gifts. They made good gifts. But I don't think we should assume that everybody liked fancy work um, or didn't have time for this non-essential uh, fussy fussiness. Uh, the 1882 dic Dictionary of Needlework defined fancy work as anything essentially decorative. Its counterpart was plain sewing, needlework of a merely useful character, which includes the work that goes into most, most patchwork quilts. I submit, and this is more a random observation than a theory, that making a gift quilt appealed to many women who chose to exercise their creativity through pattern and color rather than that fancy complicated stitchery like um, embroidering corset covers and things like this. Um, this is, it did have a note with it at the uh, Mennonite, Mennonite Farm Museum over in Lewis County. And it was uh, a note that Katie Widrick Mosier, a Mennonite woman who made this comforter around the turn of the century, um, wrote, this is my kind of fancy work. Um, she must have been a pretty straightforward woman who didn't like messing around. Cross stitch is, is a herringbone stitch was about it for her. More typical of the fancy work applied to a gift quilt is um, in a crazy quilt. Uh, and here's a good example of this. Uh, it, it's very fancy on the um, left here. You see pretty much the whole thing. And you can see this ribbon in the middle here it says YLHMB, which stands for Young Ladies Home Mission Band. Uh, and what made it a very special gift was on the back, as you see over here on the right, there's this, app, this star applique onto the back and it is signed by um, a whole bunch of people. Uh, it's inscribed a Merry Christmas to Mrs. Miss S. M. Becker from and with the love of the Home Mission Band of Amsterdam, New York. Miss Becker was 44 that year, an unmarried woman who earned her living as a dressmaker. But in her spare time, she apparently directed this group that aided the urban poor. Amsterdam is a city on the Mohawk River that at the time was home to large factories making brooms and carpets. In spite of the name, there are several men listed on the back of the quilt. Yeah, it wasn't all just young ladies. Friendship quilts, in which each block is signed by a separate individual, were popular presentation gifts for ministers, teachers, or friends leaving town from the 1850s through the 1870s in the North Country and I'm sure down in Ontario County as well. Um, this is the most spectacular one I've turned up anywhere. It was made for Joseph Ronnie Bruno, you see J-R-B here, um, who, and it has 47 different um, unique uh, applique blocks. Um, he, Joseph Ronnie Bruno was the cook at the North River Hotel, which you see there on the left, um, and he left his job in 1894, and his friends got together and gave him this. And I like this, the contrast of the picture of the hotel on the left with the quilt on the right, because you see in the middle there is the um, stagecoach that brought the tourists to the hotel from the end of the railroad line down the road in North Creek. Each block is signed, uh, most with initials, alas for the historian, but a few with full names. Activities available at the North River Hotel um, are pict pictured on the uh, quilt, 
and there was there were this the sorts of things that any well-appointed hotel in the Adirondacks would offer fishing hunting tennis croquet drinking cards all commemorated with these original applique designs which were pieced over paper patterns by the way um which are still in there you can you can crinkle it and and feel the paper some of the blocks um commemorated bruno's uh occupation there as cook and some of them commemorated his membership in the local um in Odd Fellows Lodge. The Odd Fellows were, were a was a, a fraternal organization that was um, second only to the Masonic lodges as the the most popular fraternal organizations in the United States um, at the end of the nineteenth century. And then there's this block, which was it puzzled me for a long time. Um, it's obviously caricatures of black people who probably, uh, black women, were probably, they were probably chambermaids at the hotel because that was about the only job that black people could get. Um, but you see, they've got fancy turbans, which are kind of three-dimensional. But why are they called the Heavenly Twins? Um, I think it's a reference to one of the first feminist novels that actually talked about uh, twins who were a boy and a girl, and the girl thought it would be more fun to live as a boy, so she cut her hair and ran around with her brother. But um, anyway, that's just speculation, but it's a pretty fabulous block. The the face and hands and shoes are actually leather sewn on there. Uh, we, we also um, in, find women making quilts to commemorate important events and to improve uh, or, um, to preserve important fabric, almost as if they were relics. This is a photograph of Mary Moon Clark, who was Rhoda's mother, sitting at home um, while, well, maybe not while, but uh, it could be while in the summer of 1876, when Rhoda, her husband, and a couple of other family members went to Philadelphia to see the Centennial Exposition. Um, but Mama stayed, her, her mother-in-law stayed home in Willsboro and made this quilt. This has obviously been cut down, but again, um, I think it's preserved, it was rebound and preserved because it was an important commemoration. Right there in the middle of this hexagon quilt, you can just barely read and make out what it says, which is Centennial Mary Clark, age 72, 1876. So that was her commemoration of the, the centen nation's centennial. Two of the earliest quilts we found speak to both thrift and commemoration, as well as linking the region to important events in the wider world. This is a whole cloth quilt made by a woman named Anna Moore Hubble sometime between her marriage in 1812 and her death mid-century. I believe her purpose was uh, at least in part to preserve and, uh, and reuse what had once been very expensive imported fabric that spoke to her family's prominence in the area. This pattern, um, this is a copper plate print, is called the Apotheosis of Franklin and Washington. And it's great. If you look at it, you can see Washington here being uh, in a chariot pulled by leopards and uh, Ben Franklin over here with Lady Liberty um, following along in his distinctive fur cap. Uh, and this, this was um, printed in England for the American market. Uh, after the revolution between 1785 and 1800. And I think it possibly was originally bed curtains that hung in Anna's house, um, or rather her, the house she grew up in. That, this is that house, um, the house of Pliny Moore, her father, in the town of Champlain. Uh, Pliny Moore was a Revolutionary War veteran who had moved to the Plattsburgh area to settle the land um, on a grant that he had gotten from being a um, Revolutionary War veteran. And over here on the right is, is not from that house, but it is from the Winterthur Museum, but it's the exact same print. Um, there you can see Washington on this chariot. Um, and this is how this fancy fabric uh, was originally used. Another um, quilt that I found that kind of it preserves not only the, the longevity of the quilter, but um, some fabric that is, that's got relic status is this one here um, that's all wool and had, came with a handwritten note um, from the donor, a grandson of the maker, 
um, giving the only information we have in the piece, but saying that it was made by the wife of Captain Walter Cole when she was age 80. His 1812 uniforms, her red petticoat. Uh, Charlotte Gunn Cole was 80 in 1868. Her husband, who had died in 1850, raised the 3rd Rifle Regiment in Jefferson County, New York, and served on the northern frontier during the War of 1812. Jefferson County is... Um, is the not top part of it is on the St. Lawrence River, the international boundary with Canada. Um, I've looked closely at the dark fabric and not all of it came from an 1812 uniform. And in fact, these men probably had to make their own uniforms, but some of it um, might have, and it was certainly the type of fabric that would be used for that type of clothing. Um, and the red petticoat is certainly classic red flannel petticoat fabric. Regardless, I think that the attribution of the quilt is at least as interesting as the quilt itself. It memorializes the vigorous old age of Charlotte. Imagine making a quilt like this at the age of 80. But just as it, she was memorializing her husband, who played a part in one of the great periods of the nation's formation. And it extended the useful life of some very high quality fabric. Now I'll finish up this talk with this picture, fully realizing you may think that this is all, this is Adirondack women, <laughs> classic Adirondack women, wearing carpet slippers, um, no teeth and smoking a pipe. Um, but I think it's a, it's a wonderful um, image of quilt making. And in fact, it's the only picture of undo, an in, undo, indubitably of a Adirondack woman that I found um, who was actually piecing a, a quilt square. But this is Sarah Sabatis, who lived in Long Lake. Uh, the picture is taken in 1885. And it really sums up um, what quilt making meant to her, I believe, at least in part. Here she is. She's finally got a chance to sit down, take a load off her feet, have a well-deserved puff on her pipe. Her milk pans are all scalded and set out to dry. But she's still going to keep her hands busy. She's still going to work on that quilt square. Quilts are indeed packed with many meanings. Um, it's difficult and sometimes just guesswork to untangle these meanings, but we persist because the quilts give us glimpses into the lives of women we might otherwise know nothing about. Quilts, like all material culture, lure us onward, dropping hints about other avenues to explore. So I can turn this back over to Ben, who can... Yes, talk. yes, perfect. Yes, thank you so much, Hallie. Um, for those of you who are watching, uh, you know, this is the perfect time to ask any questions you may have. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and ask them in the chat. Um, in the meantime, uh, I've got a question that can start us out. Um... So all the way back when you're talking about the tied quilts, I just had a I just had a, a question about um, the stitches, uh, the exposed stitches. Was that sort of an intentional stylistic choice, or did it have more to do with the technique or the types of materials that were being used in the tied quilts? Yeah, um, I think it's a good observation, and I um, wondered about that myself, and I found quite a lot of different ways of tying. So you can just take a couple of stitches and make a knot, but very often uh, I found women had put um, other tuff tufts of other colors of yarn in there or um, made different colors of yarn across the quilt. So yes, they weren't, they weren't doing fancy stitching in all those fancy patterns, yeah. but are still using it as part of the ornamentation. Awesome. Um, okay, great. Uh, my next question is, um, do you, you know, you talked about sort of quilting groups uh, uh, being a vector of sort of social um, engagement. Um, is there any evidence of it also being sort of a vector for political engagement in the North Country? I imagine there is. I didn't come across any di any direct evidence of it myself, but yeah. I know that um, scholars looking at the, the big scene definitely link um, getting together and talking over things uh, like with... Um, quilting bees with um suffragism yeah. and and abolitionism 
Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly why I was asking. Great. Um, are there any other questions from the chat? Oh, yes, I do have one. Um, where did they source their notions of threads and needles? Um, local stores. I, I found some going, uh, some store records going way back into the 1850s, right mm -hmm. in the middle of the Adirondacks. And, um, and you could get your stuff there. It, uh, interestingly, they're very often operating on a non-cash basis. And you, the storekeeper would keep an account. And I found um, one woman in particular knit a lot of mittens. And she would get credit at 50, 50 cents a pair for her mittens. And then she could use that credit you know that would be marked off against her needles and thread and and fabric that she bought there great the um you know in other parts of the uh country at the time out west in particular there's a big deal with um railroads and uh and mail order catalogs which would have would which would be available around the edges of the adirondacks and the st lawrence valley and mm -hmm. that but there weren't very few rail there was only one railroad that went right through the adirondacks anyway so that wasn't so available yeah great are there any other questions from the chat to close us out and i'll give us i'll give us a second to uh catch up with the chat a second to catch up with us is anybody curious about this picture? Is this st this is still on the screen, right? Yeah, I you can tell me <laughs> about the picture. I'm curious about it. I, I always like to throw this in. This picture came from the papers of um, Paul or of, of uh, a gr famous conservationist down on Lake George, and he was a nut about um, I, of skating, skate sailing. And you can see this picture. These guys are on the ice. They've got ice skates on, and they oh, yeah. rigged up, taken an old quilt to rig up as a sail, and they're going to go screaming <laughs> across Lake George. I love that. I love that. I've got another question from the chat. Uh, so did you ever find quilts that may have passed through several generations? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, what the, I, I looked at a lot of quilts from uh, museum collections, but we also uh, have, have been having quilt documentation days uh, to which people bring quilts in their own collections which has been great because very often they know more about them than the ones that got left at the museums. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Great. And as I mentioned earlier, the ones that, that a lot of them got worn up and completely worn out. Some of them got recovered, but then hmm. the ones that you see are very often the, the gift quilts, the ones that commemorate special occasions, um, the ones that, that have the put, somebody put a lot of work into yeah well great um i think that is all of the questions that i've gotten uh so i will go ahead and uh close us out uh thank you hallie and thank you again everyone for tuning in to this talk and any of the other talks in this series um thank you for making this such a success and uh Hope everyone has a good rest of the night and keep an eye out uh, for announcements about our speaker series for next winter. Um, but with that, I'll close us out. So have a good night, everyone. Good night, and thank you for having me. Thank you.